Racing is a love story. A world that some can't understand, but a spectacle that no one can deny. It's where streaks are made and streaks are broken. Heroes are villains. Where the impossible becomes possible. Curses can be lifted. And sons can fulfill the dreams of their fathers. It's where you can be a kid again and where nothing else matters except the moment we are in. This is the most important race of the year to me. I think it's safe to say you're my one true romance in racing. Right. Eldora Speedway, and these are the best late models and the best drivers in the nation. It was the greatest race that I'd ever won. Everybody said he could do it. And we've done it. Right At Eldora Speedway, all things are possible one weekend in September. And for one night a year, one man can rule the world. It's everything. It's, uh, you know, this place, it's just something that's hard to explain. Welcome to the latest chapter in this never-ending love story. For the 53rd time, September means the world. The first climber from the state of Illinois to win the world. I don't know if anything will be able to slow down Superman. Tim McCready, you are a world champion. Jonathan this is third World 100. This is the biggest race that we have. This is our Daytona 500. This is it. Checkered flag is in the air, and for the fifth time, the World 100 winner is Superman Jonathan Davenport. Like you said, it's just really, really un unreal that, that I've gotten this far. So it's just awesome. We're just going to take it with stride and keep on, and maybe we'll see you back here again and tie old Billy. Man, that was good. Derek, not a lot of people know this, but the past 90 days, I have actually been away from Flow Sports. I thought you were never coming back. <laughs> I think a lot of people thought that, and we're hoping that maybe. When you've been at Flow for 15 years, and in this case, that 15 years counts my time at Dirt on Dirt, you get a mandatory, you don't get, you have to take a mandatory 90-day sabbatical. They want you to refresh your batteries, come back recharged. Uh, now, I broke those rules plenty during my time away. There was actually more work I was doing than I was supposed to be doing. But as luck would have it, my first official day back from that 90-day sabbatical is today. And, and what a perfect time, right? It is officially World 100 Week to return. And as I said, in 2019, in what has become that very famous home pre-race hype piece that we did, you don't live here, but you are from here. We all are. Welcome home to the World 100. This is your video cast for Tuesday, September 5th, and quite simply, it is World Week. And Kane, show me that aerial video. I wanted to, I just is this live? To, I, yeah, this is not live. Oh, okay. We are not racing just in Eldora sure. yet. I wanted to feel it a little bit more while I was talking about it. I am Michael Rigsby inside the Dirt on Dirt and Flow Racing Studios, joined by my World 100 loving co-host, Derek Kessinger Suave. Also, for the 17th time now, Suave, this is the World 100 preview video cast. It's hard to believe not that many things last the test of time. We've done this now 17 consecutive years. I have been to every World 100 myself since 1992. You have been to every World since, is it 99? Yes. Is that right? Since Francis, 1999. Francis, you're the Francis. You know, I know you're a guy, Suave, you live on the lighter edge, right? You like to joke around a lot. You can have fun with the best of them. But I want to know from the bottom of your heart, 
what this week means to you. And there's been some criticism of Eldora uh, this don't week even get me started. on Facebook, which is odd, very odd to me. Uh, I just, I really want to know from the bottom of your heart, people know what it means to me. What does Eldora, what does this, what does this event specifically mean to you, Derek? Uh, during that video, it said, ain't nobody able to do the World 100. So uh, that just speaks <laughs> right there, those five or six words. But I'm kind of pissed, uh, Rigsby. Okay. Very pissed. You see all these Nimrod's comments on social media saying Eldora is the most overhyped event in the country or Eldora isn't the same, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but let's be honest. The World 100 has earned the hype. Yes. It has the highest car counts. It has the biggest crowd by far by in our far. sport. It's $5,300 to start. That's pretty damn impressive. It's the damn World 100. In terms of racing, I think we might have winner's fatigue because JD just keeps yeah. dominating there. But how about you tell your favorite driver to get faster and pass Jonathan <laughs> Davenport? Maybe we're tired of him winning, but I don't think he's tired of winning. He's trying to go for Globe 6, but to say it's overhyped, it's pretty ridiculous. The crowd is going to be massive. It's fun. Yeah. It's, there's just always great moments. And I wanted to start by talking about that a little bit. I think um, some of the folks that have been criticizing us, candidly, too, for overhyping this event long before uh, the media, I, which I guess is us and Dirt Late Model Racing existed, this was the biggest event. Long before we came along, the World 100 had earned its place as the biggest event. Uh, and it's not, yeah, let's, let's be candid. The dream was not good, right? The racetrack was not good at the dirt late model dream. They need it to be better for the world 100. I have no problem saying when a racetrack's not racing well and Eldora at the dream was not great. Um, it's not been perfect the last couple of years. I think at any moment though, Eldora can snap back and have a really good race. It's not only about the racing at the world 100. I, this is no bullshit for me. When I go there, there is a feeling that I get that you cannot get anywhere else. It's family, it's love, it's friendship, it's fellowship, it's all of those things. It, 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 it's an emotion, Derek, that is evoked when you pull up on Highway 118 that is not hype. Hype is not the right word for that. When something strikes you to your core and in your soul and in the deepest part of you, which is where Eldora hits me, and I'm fortunate enough, the one to have the microphone to be talking about this now, and I think many other people feel the same way, that's not hype. That's reality. The reality is that of the 100 drivers there this weekend, 90 of them would say their most desired win is the World 100 in the sport. That's not hype. That's just reality. And Eldora has a way of pulling an emotion out of you. I almost get tearful every time I go there. That's not hype. That's raw, powerful emotion. And if people think that we are going too far by talking about this event, they've not experienced the four, nearly 30 or 40 years, Derek, that you and I have experienced there together. This place is special. This place is magical. And if people can't see that, it's not really an opinion. They're just wrong from where I sit. Uh, I'm ready to run through a brick wall for you, Riggs. That was <laughs> that was emotional. But yeah, you're exactly right. Just the people you see every single year in the sections you might have sat it sat with. It's That's, the only yes. time the only time you get to see them maybe throughout the year. Uh, it's just I don't know. Listen to those guys' sound bites when they win the World 100 in that video hype piece. It, they're they're truly special and. Uh, everything means more at the world 100 especially and at eldora speedway but we'll have to wait and see it's gonna be a fun weekend and we might talk about a little bit just like yeah. the hype factor with yeah. just how today's racing is and just how much we race as well later on i could do three hours of me sitting here oh well, i don't about want you eldora. to cry and, you know people will be like oh you, you, you have a business interest in eldora of course we needed to do well but derek there's a hundred tracks out there that we don't have a business we go to volution cover the crap out of it every year volution does not benefit us from a business perspective at all nor does cedar lake anymore nor do many of these racetracks that i love it just so happens eldora has earned its rightful place Last thing I'll say on that for now. So we've got a packed 90 minutes. As always, we've got our media roundtable. Todd, Kevin, Ben, and DJ, our four experts, are going to join us. Uh, World 100 favorite, at least a co-favorite. Bobby Pierce will join us to talk about chasing his second World 100 title in the amazing season that Bobby has had. Derek's been seven years. He has a World 100 championship. People forget that. Seven years ago when he was 19, that's hard he to believe. He couldn't even drink beer seven. legally when uh, he, he last He definitely won could it. not. So, <laughs> yeah, seven 19. years went by pretty fast for uh, the smooth operator. I mentioned the co-favorite. We're going to break down that Ricky Thornton Jr. versus Bobby Pierce, who's the best driver in the country battle right now. We've got an awesome graphic that we're going to show you. I don't know that the graphic proves anything one way or the other, Derek, but when you see the numbers laid out, 
it becomes even more of a compelling argument, I think. So we're going to look at that. Uh, we've got so much more on Eldora as well. Todd Turner is going to provide us with some of the insight that he does through his full screen graphics that he creates that I love so much. And, and maybe most importantly, don't forget every lap of the World 100 you can watch live this weekend on Flow Racing. I, I love that logo. The 53rd World 100 this weekend, Derek, at Eldora. 53rd. I remember when it was the 20th back in the day, right? It's hard to believe that we're at the 53rd already. Uh, quickly, before we get to our media roundtable, we do this often before we preview Eldora. We're coming off Labor Day, right? Which to me is my favorite racing weekend of the year. Uh, I, I want some thoughts from this past weekend from you on Labor Day, Derek, prior to going into the World 100. What do you got? So Bobby Pearson, Ricky Thornton Jr. got two dubs over this yep. past weekend, and they are both around the $750,000 <laughs> mark, counting bonuses, uh, their victories. Uh, that's not even counting their points money they're going to get at the end of the season. It'll be kind of nuts with J.D. getting $2 million last year, uh, Overton and Brandon Shepard getting close, close the years before that. That we could have two guys reach, you know, the million dollar mark, not even running the same series, just going battling it out and, uh, you know, it's different events that that'd be pretty impressive. If we can get that. So it'll be uh, a lot of eyes are going to be on those two this weekend. Yeah. Um, also Brandon Overton, he's starting to click top fives yeah. lately. Uh, great article by Kevin Kovac there last week. He's saying he's feeling a lot better because people forget he did not make the dirt late metal dream. He had that yeah. nasty crash. Kind of hurt his neck there and wasn't feeling the same. He's starting to feel healthier. I think he's a very, which is kind of shocking to say that Brandon Overton might horse. be a dark yeah. horse <laughs> at the <laughs> World 100. So I'm, I think it's going to be a redemption tour for Big Sexy going back to Rossburg. Um, and could it be Superman Hour at Eldora? Uh, the previous five World 100 victories, four of those weekends, the weekend before on Labor Day, he got victories. So oh, he won. Okay. So he won. The Hillbilly 100. Other weekends, he's won that Portsmouth yeah, race, a Ponderosa yeah. a couple in 2020 when he won the Intercontinental. So if he wins on Labor Day weekend, chances are he's going to have a very good run at the World 100. I've got some a uh, little more off the cuff Labor Day notes. A bit of a renaissance suave for Jason Fager right now. He's got back. His 13th victory of the year this past weekend. He swept the Mars weekend. He's also been second nine times this year. He made sure to point that out to me. It was his third straight Mars victory. Most wins in a year for Jason Fager since 2011. Probably going to so win the national championship. Should win the Mars championship and the UMP national championship. You know, I grew up in Bloomington. Jason's from Bloomington. So I think for guys like Derek and I, it's cool to see who was really one of the first big Big t-shirt design guys in the country, Jason Fager, to get out there and start running well again. Um, secondly, no secret, we're pretty friendly with the Hunt the Front gang. Joshua Joyner, you know, he's part of the, the, the one of the family members there. He worked for Dirt on Dirt. I think maybe a total of five years across two different employment I couldn't times. keep up at some points when he was going <laughs> back and forth. Uh, they've, they've put together a really nice tour with Hunt the Front. I'm so proud of those guys. Dale McDowell got that $15,000 victory at Rome, Derek. How many wins on the year for McDowell? Do you know? It's a sneaky number. I'm gonna go eleven. That's ten. So Ooh. you're pretty you're pretty close there. There was some controversy at the end of that race, or not necessarily at the end, uh, but McDowell got out and was unhappy when they put him back on a caution for the blend rule on that lap twenty five caution. Uh, I wanted to kind of mention that because Dale's usually not very um, – Dale was very um, – I'm trying to use, think of the right word here. He was very critical of the series when he got out, and he's not always like that. I think Joshua and those guys are finding out, man. Is it, They have done such a good job with Hunt the Front this year. But, man, running the series, and Ben Shelton will tell you this later, it's a pain in the ass to run a series. Can't make it's anybody just, happy. No, no one's ever happy, and I told Joshua that. Joshua, of course, brother is Joseph, and he said, man, he goes, the worst people in the world are racers. And he goes, I mean that complimentary, but they – complained about everything and I said yeah that's that's going to happen so I wanted to call that out it was an interesting development on that lap 25 caution I think Joshua did his best to explain it to Dale I think that'll eventually blow over uh, Derek Turbo made that switch to MB over the weekend to the MB car Mississippi Thunder on Friday night drove 11 and a half hours to Portsmouth on Saturday for that Lucas Oil race. I thought that was an interesting travel note, and I'm I'm assuming he ran the MB at, at Mississippi Thunder because he wanted Sorensen and those guys around, right? He a little, little closer to Jimmy Mars there. Did you talk to Turbo at all about that or no? No, but he made some uh, some funny comments. Some guy on Facebook says, I can't believe that. you got an MB Custom. <laughs> those things are only good in northern Wisconsin. Turbo, being Turbo, says you can send a blank check to his address in Ohio. I won't give it out. 
in the envelope, please let us know what car you'd like us to run, and we'll order three new ones right now. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and the return, in, the return yeah, address. That was receipts. very shocking, kind of a mid-season shenanigans note. While a lot of sprint car craziness has happened the last couple weeks, yeah, but my uh, God, yeah. that one, that one was pretty, uh, pretty shocking and uh, surprising to have him go all the way up to Mississippi Thunder and then debut a Mars car. Yeah, 11 and a half hours to Portsmouth. He's seventh in Lucas Oil points. Dalton Wilson, Derek, still hunting that first national touring win. He jumped the cushion at PRP in the Lucas race. He, he led laps, I think it was 17 through 31. The night before in the unsanctioned race, the Boone Coleman at Portsmouth, he, he had a motor let go. He's led, led, Derek, six Lucas Oil races this year. Um, and still not gotten a victory in a national tour. It just feels like, I don't know if it's going to happen before the end of this year, but man, it, don't, it feels like next year Dalton Wilson could win five Lucas Oil races. Yeah, you, know? you see guys that have been knocking at the door in uh, years past trying to get their first uh, yeah. national win, and they fall short, and then they keep progressing, keep progressing. And let's just maybe... Just maybe he'll get over that hump here. We don't have that many Lucas Oil races left to go either. No. And uh, also, uh, Jason Jameson will be driving the other Ratliff car at the World 100 this weekend. So Jameson back. So that'll be interesting. Um, lastly, on Labor Day weekend, just the amount of money shelled out. Bobby Pierce wins a $20,000 to win race. He also won an MLRA race, the Wiener Nationals. My favorite for, event. For 10000 on Sunday. Sheppy wins a 20K race. But speaking of, Derek, Brandon Shepard will talk more about him. I got, what some, he's got, got going some good news. For the World 100. Art Ricky Thornton Jr. wins the Hillbilly. Um, he wins. He doesn't win the Hillbilly. Hillbilly, excuse me, wins Portsmouth. Portsmouth Portsmouth on Saturday and then won the unsanctioned race at Portsmouth the night before. So, sorry about that. I had to get that all right. Dale McDowell wins fifteen grand. Chad Simpson wins 11000 Derek, Josh Rice, $20,000 between two um, Ultimate Heart of America wins this weekend. He now has 11 victories on the years. Red Hill also ran in Illinois on Saturday. Ashton Winger wins ten grand. Mason Ziegler wins 12000 It was a busy Labor Day weekend. Our, our Racewire crew... Led by Todd Turner, Kevin Kovac, Aaron, and those guys at Dirt on Dirt did an amazing job of updating everything. Busy, a lot of money shelled out this weekend, Suave. Hate to see it. A lot of money. People <laughs> still complaining sometimes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a right. lot of races that are paying, you know, five, ten. Now it's like ten grand is just like the new, the new just two whatever, grand. right? So yeah. yeah, this is it's great to see different drivers and the part of uh, different parts of the country. And I think that's what Labor Day weekend is. It was used to be like the closing of weekly yeah, not races. Anymore. Yeah. Not anymore, but you still have those regional type victories throughout the country that pay, you know, big time events. Yeah, for yeah them. you get good regional crowds. We right. had a great crowd at Fairbury on Saturday night. You can still get a good regional crowd by hosting a five or ten thousand to win right. race. Wanted to mention some of those guys. Uh let's start with our World One Hundred stuff. I talked about those Todd Turner graphics. We're moments away from the media round table. Let's start first with this one. Todd bringing us his insight on the World One Hundred. I don't typically see these till we go on air. Derek, I love this. Oldest winner of the World 100 ever, 52 years and 10 months, Billy Moyer. Eldora's oldest major race winner, just a year older, barely. Uh, Freddie Smith, 53 years ago when he won the 2000 Dream. Uh, I thought this note was really interesting from Todd. Outside of his five World 100 wins, Jonathan Davenport only has one top five finish in the World 100. Of course, I guess when you've won it five times, who gives a shit? Right. <laughs> but that's kind of crazy, right? Only one other top five finish. Ohio has not had multiple World 100 starters since 2018, Derek, and hasn't had a top five finisher since Matt Miller nine years ago. That's hard to believe for the state of Ohio. Uh, they might be washed. Been Ooh, racing. Zing. You hear that? I know that is Devin very shocking. Moran. Shot at Devin yeah. Moran right there. Well, I mean, maybe. we have to have two guys. That's I mean, true. We That's a Devin, good point. So, so as a state, they're as watching. As a state, say. yes. Bobby Pierce is the only driver with three World 100 top five finishes before he was 20 years old, which is incredible. He turns 21 Brian tomorrow. Burkoffer, you mentioned that uh, Eldora race that Ricky Weiss won uh, Sunday night. Uh, Burkoffer is the only driver to win at Eldora in September preceding the World 100 capturing a Sunoco, or the last one, excuse me, in 2002, Derek, so 21 years ago since somebody's won that ALMS race and then gone on to win the World 100. And the 2021 event was the only World 100 with two Western drivers, Arizona's Ricky Thornton Jr. and California's Kyle Larson, if he counts, I guess. Supposed to race this weekend that his dad wouldn't let him race this weekend. So too scared. <laughs> uh, is the only uh, kind of neat, you know, two guys from the West Coast. Not a typical thing in dirt late model racing. Very typical thing in sprint car racing. Okay, we'll have more Todd information before the before the uh, video cast is over. But it's time for the media roundtable for the seventeenth consecutive year media roundtable as we preview the World One Hundred. As always, we kick things off with our good friend Ben Shelton. Ben, it has been a busy summer for you, right? You've been on the road a lot. Arkansas, Minnesota, Pennsylvania. You've been eating concession stand foods and staying in hotels and doing everything in between. 
I want an honest answer. You've been everywhere. Similar to the way I asked Derek this question earlier, why does this weekend of all of them mean more to you, Benji? It means more to me because as a kid, Eldora was this mythical place where all these (laughs) mega events were held. And I'd hear people at Memphis Motorsports Park and Riverside International Speedway, they'd talk about planning to go there. And I just couldn't fathom it. It was a dream. And I didn't get my first taste until I think it was the 2003 World 100 Chubb one that year. And that was as a fan. I definitely never dreamed sitting in the stands that night that a decade later I'd be actively working some of their biggest events. You know, and for me, Eldora is like Knoxville. And when you pull in the parking lot, the history and the vibe of the place, it hits you every single time. It's plain and simple, a holy ground for our sport, and the World 100 is our Super Bowl. Every driver wants a globe, and this weekend, the most prestigious of Dirt Late Model Racing's trophies will be earned by a deserving driver. I've been busy. I hadn't seen a lot of social media. Uh, I'm going to trust you guys on what you've got, but I'm going to say this. If somebody's saying it's overrated, we overpump it, they're thirsty. It, it's an attention <laughs> grab, and I feel sorry for them. That's all I'll say. Thirsty in the first block of the mid year. I love table. thirsty. I love Good it. job, Ben. Um, you know more uh, really about this sport, maybe than anybody I know, Ben. And obviously, you know Todd's Todd's a legend, and I put his knowledge ball up there. But just because you travel so much now, when you go so many places, you just you just interact with everyone more than anybody does. You and DJ both. Um, I know you know things that most people don't. Give me a few of those things. Some stuff people might not know headed into the World 100 that you pick up, you learn along the way uh, that I think the, the general public would love to hear. Well, that's that's a lot of pressure and definitely too much credit. But uh, <laughs> here's a few things that I, some, I think some may know, but they might not. We wondered if anybody would ever touch Moyer's six globes. Yeah. And this weekend at the age of 39, Davenport has a chance to match him at six. And as you said earlier, the last one came in 2010 when Moyer was 52 years old in 10 months. Davenport won't be 40 until later this year. Uh, Davenport's obviously won five of the past eight runnings, and he heads into the weekend with a lucky 13 number of wins this season. I think that could spell into something, obviously, and his his history at Eldora you can't denote, uh, deny. Uh, no big secret, Longhorn Chassis has been hot this year, and they've got quite the streak at the World 100. They've won seven of the last eight. You talked about Bobby Pierce back in, in 16 doing it, and yeah, he did that with a Bob Pierce race car. With all that said, though, Eldora's got this way of being the great equalizer, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a different chassis hoisting that globe above their head this weekend. Um, you know, one for the history books, Bobby Pierce and Ricky Thornton Jr. each lead the respective national tour points for the first time ever heading into this weekend's event. And, you know, I think what's even more amazing, I was working on my notes this morning, Ricky Thornton Jr. has won 17 of his 44 Lucas Oil starts this year. He's won 38% of the Lucas Oil races he's been in for features. Bobby Pierce has won 11 of 31. That's 35%. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, a couple of little uh, things I want to mention, definitely not small. Uh, check out the Road del Dora that I did with Mike and Jan Unger. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, they, they just, they mean so much to us. But I think it's flown under the radar that the Shane Unger Memorial Rookie Award program has got a boost of $3,000 over last year. And the best performing rookie, if you come out and you kick butt every night, you can leave with an extra $6,500 in just rookie awards. Um, and then last but not least for me is the total purse. $567,900, right at $568,000, which is an increase of almost $30,000 over last year. The feature alone on Saturday uh, sits at right at $257,000, $56,000 to win or $5,300 to start. These are not small peanuts that we're messing with this weekend. And oh, by the way, I think all these guys would come if they were just racing for the damn globe. So again, not overhyped, it's reality. So are you sad that we possibly won't have a Bloomquist moment at the scales this year. I mean, all point, all signs are pointing that he probably won't race. You just never know with the guy. But, I mean, it's kind of like another passing of the torch of the you know the legacy and history of this event that we just got to keep moving on and we'll have some new uh, memories. But I mean, you're gonna be you handle those situations very well. I don't think it's gonna happen this weekend. Man, I hate it. I mean, maybe he'll walk on to the skill when you know when somebody goes on. I don't know. I I really hate him not being there. It's. It's just not Eldor without him. We had the, the, the uh, Bloomquist lost uh, tapes from the road to Eldor this year, and it just got me to thinking. And I am holding out hope. I think you're right, Derek. We're not going to see him this weekend, but I'm ho- ho- holding out hope he's not done at Eldora, and he's got one or two memories we'll never forget still in his hip pocket. Benji, a winner, World 100, is who for you? 
Well, I picked him multiple times before, and I think I've jinxed him every one of them. But I am going with Dell McDowell. I love where he's at this year. He got 100000 at Bulls Gap earlier this year. He got 50000 at the Topless. Um, I think that all the factors probably point to Davenport, but I think Dell McDowell, smooth and consistent, low groove, you see it on your screen, he's going to pick up 56000 this weekend at Eldora. All right, Ben, great job all year. I know the, the folks will be looking forward to seeing you in Victory Lane, whoever that is on Saturday night. We'll see you tomorrow, okay? Thanks, guys. Next up, Kevin Kovac, our good friend who always t- takes a little too long to get on this it's call. It's all right. He's here, though. You know, suave at the beginning. Everybody else is on and ready. Kevin's writing notes, you know, doing stuff. Kevin, we are entered into this age now of high, high dirt late model dollar counts in the sport, right? All these big purses where every weekend there is a race that pays as much, if not more, than the World 100 almost every weekend now. I think we've all said that, hey, you know, this will always be the biggest race, right? Eldora, the World 100 will always be the biggest race. For me, through all the big money races, the World 100 still does stand above them, no matter what everybody else does. But I kind of want to know from your perspective, do you think I'm right about that? And if I'm right, why am I right about that? And I want your honest opinion. Oh, definitely. It's, uh, it's, you, you explained it so well in your uh, opening statements there, just about like h- how you, you get a special feel when you, when you go to Aldo. I mean, I've always said it. Every, I think I've said this on many video casts. How I get that feel like I'm going to the Magic Kingdom at Disney World or something, <laughs> you know, because you don't see that racetrack from the outside. It's kind of, you know, hidden down. You don't, it's like when you go into a stadium and see the green grass or something, uh, a baseball field for the first time, you kind of walk into Eldora and see that uh, track sitting down, sunken into the, you know, into the, into the ground there and all those ha- haulers and the pits. And it just, it's just a special feel. And, and I know everybody always talks about this magic of Pennsboro, you know, like it's always been like, this is that, well, why that? And, and Pennsboro, like, is, I mean, that was never great racing. I mean, that was, I mean, you compare that to Eldora racing and there was no comparison, you know, and, uh, and, and, and why it, there's a magic of Eldora too. I mean, they, you have that magic of a Pennsboro. That's kind of like it's out in the woods and stuff like that, I guess. But, you know, magic of Pen, of uh, Eldora out in the corner fields of uh, western ohio it's really there it's always been there for me one other thing i always think about when about eldor why it's so big how many people are there it's one of the only races i go to where like as i'm driving there nine hours away i'm driving home back nine hours it seems like i will see people that are heading i know that are heading to eldora along the way it, it just so it's so many people that they're so spread out all over the place i'll stop in a rest stop hours and hours from eldora there's fans that are going there. It's just so big. It come people from all over the place. I mean, you, you can't escape it. Kevin, you're the best note taker in dirt late model racing. Suave, I think we agree with that, right? Nobody takes better notes. Uh, nope. Let's let's get right to them. Unload that notebook on me. What do you got? A couple of them for the world this weekend. Derek touched a little bit about Brandon Overton earlier, but I talked to him last week at a Port Royal, and uh, and those two wrecks that he had, especially the first one when he blew the right front tire and hit that wall and uh, at the Dream. Um, man, I, that really did that, that got him pretty good. His neck. I mean, he, it was a good three months. Now he said that the doctors had told him it would probably take a, a few months there for him to not feel sore and, and be able to sleep well and everything. And, and he said that week before a Port Royal was the best week he'd had since those two wrecks. Um, he really stretched his neck out in those deals. And, uh, and he was, uh, he, he wasn't a hundred percent all summer. Uh, he kind he, getting back to it now. I mean, he's had top fives now. He's run well. He's led races. I think he has that little bit coming back to him. He's a little fired up there, too, after that, uh, I think, uh, Portsmouth, I think it was, on a Saturday night. I mean, he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't exactly happy, you know. Like, he says he had overheating problems. But I wouldn't uh, be surprised. I mean, this is back where he, he – maybe he had his bad luck now at Eldor. I, everyone's had their bad nights. They're, even the biggest guys have had bad weekends at Eldor. And I think uh, he'll be – He'll be uh, all right. There's going to be some special paint uh, wraps this year, too. Uh, I haven't had a million of those in the last few years, but there's just a, geez, pre some. There, I've seen some debuts of some pretty neat ones. You know, Mike Marler is going to have one. It's got a World War II plane uh, kind of look for his 157. Uh, Devin Moran has one. I, I just saw last night he unveiled it, kind of a, a white with a lighter blue 99 on there. And, uh, and uh, one that's really cool is Dalton Wilson with the, Earl Pearson Jr. 2006 
World 100 winner throwback to the Dunn Benson team. Uh, he works at a shop that's uh, uh, down in North Carolina that's right near, right next door to, to, um, to the Lambs uh, office. And, and so he's kind of been helped by them a little bit, and he's going to do something. I think that looks, it looks really cool from the pictures I've seen. That'll be a, a good throwback to probably the best World 100 ever, 2006. Maybe Dalton could pull something off with uh, make that get that up front. Uh, uh, chassis note there, Brent Ben mentioned about uh, Longhorn. They've won the last five actually in a row, uh, World 100s. That's the longest streak of a brand uh, in the last 25 years. We our chassis lists for uh, for the Eldora World 100s go back about that far. Earlier ones don't have the chassis, but you know from the last 25 years, no one's won five in a row uh, with the chassis brand. And uh, and and talking about chassis, how about Rocket One, Mark Richards. He's never won the World 100 still, 62 years old. He won the dream in 2019 with Brandon Shepard. Still never won the world, though. And he's never even finished second as a car owner or crew chief over the last, what, 40 years that he's been going there, which is incredible. I mean, he's he said he feels like Dale Earnhardt at, uh, at Daytona, at uh, the Daytona 500 right now. So uh, Hudson O'Neill makes his eighth start, his eighth attempt at the World 100 this week. Maybe he brings Eldora, you know, glory in the World 100 to Mark for the first time. He's definitely due. Uh, I just got a text, Kovac, from Jonathan Bateman, and they will have a blocker on NBC Sports for Thursday night. <laughs> so you will not be able to watch the Lions game. It'll be more of an old school flair where we have, you know, no good internet or phone coverage. So I'm just, that's, uh, that's I don't know, just thoughts on that. Oh, uh, no, we <laughs> will not have that happen. There has to, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, you know, I'm, I wish the race, the game wasn't on Thursday night of Eldora, but. You know, my team finally is getting some national exposure. Got a little bit of, um, you know, pump up to them. And uh, I will be keeping my eye on what. Oh, I know you will. I had to say something about that. Sorry. All right, uh, Rigsby. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Winner. Uh, Great question. Uh, Winner, first of all, Thursday night of the football game quickly and the winner of the World 100. Go back. Come on. I'm going Lions. Come on. We got to go Lions. We're going to have the pipe going up. The Dan Campbell coach of the year. Everything. I mean, the rookies are going to get some touchdowns. I I feel it. Come on. I can't go the other way. It's going to be like when they beat the Pack. In Sunday night game, okay. that was and glorious. Calm down. That was let's glorious. hope. Let's hope. You know? Okay, who's your World 100 uh, winner then? <laughs> uh, World 100 winner. I'm sticking right with uh, this. Was the one that hit me. I'm sticking right with what with Ben said. Dale McDowell. Uh, it just uh, you know when he won that topless, uh, I saw him race. Uh, you know, win a race at, at with the Southern National this year. I don't know. Just something. Just something feels right that this is going to be the year that he wins the World 100. You know. You know, outright. I mean, he's got one. But it was by, you know, it wasn't that exact uh, excitement of crossing the checkered flag first because of the Shannon Babb incident, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, Wayne and Light. So let's go. Dale McDowell, he blows away the oldest winner uh, for the, you know, five <laughs> years older than Billy Moore was. Let's go, Dale. All right. Thanks, Kevin. We'll see you this week. All right. See you later. Voice of Castro Flow Racing Night in America, one of the voice of the TV races for Lucas Oil with James Essex and the voice of Eldora Speedway. It is our own Dustin Jarrett. DJ. World 100, I'm going to do something a little different with you. I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to go, DJ, World 100. Now you react. <laughs> uh, wow. What do you even say? It's it's the Mecca, right? And and I'm not sure that I can add any more than anyone else has already added. But um, I will go and I, I'll reference something Ben had mentioned where I, I don't think any of us have a, a whole ton of time to be on social media right now. But I did see a post from someone, it may have been Shannon Buckingham earlier this week, where he said, look, there's there may be one event all year that, that you that you watch. Right. Or if there is only one event all year that you watch or that you pay attention to, it's it's the world 100. Right. And, and that's not. That's not because of anything that we do. That's not because of anything that anyone else is. It's because it is the race. It is the Mecca. And as you guys said, to kind of open things up, that was long before, right? Long before uh, Flow was around, long before Dirt on Dirt was around. And and there's a reason, right? There, there's a reason that everybody tunes into it. And look, the Super Bowl, the National Championship, the World Series, whatever, may not be the best games that you see all year. Eldora may not provide the best racing the world. This may not be the best race that you see all year, but all eyes will be on it. And I think that's something that we all need to keep in mind. There's a reason for that. And again, it's not because of media hype. It's not because of anything that we've done. And again, it may not be because it's the best race all year. This may not be a race year. This this may not even be close to a race of the year. But all eyes are on it because it's the Mecca, because it's the granddaddy of them all. all. And, And honestly, 
we all we all have a vested interest in this in some way, shape, or form because we're fans of the sport, because we're involved in it, and and honestly, we just want to know. We all love being a part of this event. You know, I think everybody is coming into this saying, of course, Jonathan Davenport has won five of these. You know, Ricky and Bobby, Bobby Pearson, Ricky Thornton Jr., the clear top two favorites. A similar question, you know, that I think we're all sort of asking ourselves. Okay, we know Ricky and Bobby and we know JD. Um, if you take those two out, who are a couple other guys who can win this race? Because, you know, Kyle Larson texts me all the time and teases me. Late model racing is becoming so predictable. I can pick every event, one of two or three guys that are going to win it. Are there other guys, DJ, that can win this race other than those one or two that I mentioned? Uh, uh, outside of Ricky and Bobby, and obviously you mentioned the, the obvious one with JD, right? But uh, there are. Um, it, it's it's. I think it's tough to break that stranglehold right now, though, of, of that – Davenport, McCready, Overton, Madden kind of mix that we're in right now and take nothing away from any of the other drivers. But when you look back on Eldora's major events over the last uh, six years or so, you're going to see the same names on the top five or six in just about every race, right? And it's going to be that group that we talked about. Now, can one of them get in there and, and overthrow uh, BP32 or RTJ? I, yeah, I absolutely think so. Can somebody win outside of that group? That's going to be a little tougher um, because no one has been consistently good at Eldora over the last few years like those drivers have. I do think that you could see a Mike Marler, a Dale McDowell, as Kevin and, and Ben mentioned, a, a Hudson O'Neill, a Brandon Shepard, who, by the way, is going to have Kevin Rumley in his corner this weekend. I do think you could see one of those guys sneak in there and, and get a win. But, man, it's it's just it's going to be really, really hard to overthrow. Outside of the two you mentioned, outside of Pierce and, and um, RTJ, it's going to be really hard to overthrow that that Davenport, McCready, Overton, Madden group that we talked about. And I was kind of going to ask you this, DJ. We kind of have like a, like you said, a winner's fatigue at Eldora, you know, since 2019, other than Brandon Overton, if you count on just the crown jewels, the dream in the world, other than Brandon Overton or Davenport. So that might be like a thing that like fans, like when JD wins again, they're like, they don't think maybe all oh, that wasn't that great of a world 100 or great dream because we're seeing the same guys win over and over. Maybe because kind of like what we did in the nineties with, you know, Moran, Bloomquist and Moyer. So was that a question? No, I was gonna say, like, <laughs> do you agree? no, no. Yeah. I was like, do you agree with that? Like, I think that there's kind of like a winner's fatigue with the fans when they leave the race. They're kind of like, well, you know, we're used to seeing these guys win it. Like maybe like there's no other guy that has a chance of winning. I yeah, guess. Is that what's going on? Are they yes. feeling winners fatigue and saying, Hey, the racing's crappy because the right. same guy's winning every week. Right. Right. No. And I, and I think that's a very valid point. And I think all you have to do is listen to uh, driver intros, right? When James and I are given driver intros, listen to the response that, that a guy like Jonathan Davenport gets now. Yeah. Versus maybe what he got five, six yeah. years ago, look, five, six years ago, when JD was was going out, when he would go and beat Bloomquist, for example, the crowd, I mean, yeah. roaring on their feet, cheering. Everybody loved Jonathan Davenport. Now, Davenport walks across that stage for driver introductions, and the cheers maybe aren't as prevalent as what they were five or six years ago, and some of those boos are a little bit louder now. And I think the only reason for that is because JD has won this event five out of the last eight years, and, and you know, that's that's all there is to it. The two guys that picked ahead of you both picked Dale McDowell. Will you follow suit, DJ? Is your winner of the 53rd World 100 also Dale McDowell? Are you going a different direction? I'm going a different direction. How do you go against the guy we just talked about, right? How do you go against Jonathan Davenport? I mean, geez, the guy has won five of the last eight World 100s. He just won the Dirt Late Model Dream earlier this year. He's been running well here, maybe a little bit better the last few weeks. Not that he's run bad all year, but he's just, I think he's found his stride. He got his second biggest win of the season just this past weekend when he won 30 grand in the Hillbilly 100. Uh, until until I, somebody proves that they uh, they can do what he has done here over the last uh, eight or ten years at Eldora, uh, the Fast 49 will certainly be my pick, I think, for a while to come. Rest that voice, DJ. You're going to need it starting Thursday. We'll see you this weekend, okay? All right, thanks, man. We wrap with the Todd father, as we always do. Todd Turner, who will be in the Dirt Late Model Hall of Fame one day, Suave, without question. Sooner than later, if I can help it, Todd will be in the Dirt Late Model Hall of Fame. Todd, one thing I can always count on you for is not that the other guys aren't honest, but I know I'm going to get a, a degree of honesty from you that I might not get from everybody else. I want to know, with all these other high-dollar races that we've talked about in the sport now, does the World 100 ever run the risk of not maybe being supplanted 
But the World 100's got to do some stuff to, to maintain that perch. Do you think that that day is getting closer? And I really want an honest answer from you about that. Well, I mean, in, in my perspective over the years, Eldora has done a lot of things yeah. over these years. This is not the place I went to, you know, the first time more than 30 years ago. To me, the, the facility, I, I think maybe we get a little... Uh, um, maybe take it for granted a little bit, just how not, how huge and nice and the signage. And of course, uh, for us media people, the media center, all that stuff is just so nice. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's a special place. I think the, the people vote with their money, right, by showing up. Uh, I think that kind of shows you what Eldor is. When the crowds are down or when some other race races are drawing more fans than the World 100, then you might be like, hey, what's going on? But clearly, the the throngs of people at the World 100, uh, they kind of vote uh, and say, uh, this is the race uh, that we don't want to miss. Give me maybe something that happened during Labor Day that could carry over or at least tie into the World 100. I often find, not not often maybe, but sometimes, and it's a little peculiar, there's a correlation between a Labor Day something and a World 100 something. Do you have anything? Well, I mean, my, the four guys that I would put on the top of the list of favorites to win uh, all won this last weekend. Now, that isn't always the case. You know, sometimes the Labor Day, you look back and you're like, wow, that guy had a, late, late, a lousy Labor Day weekend. And then he won the World 100 or he hadn't won for a while. Uh, but you feel like anybody that's winning, you want confidence. Uh, anybody that's winning, like uh, those guys this weekend, Thornton, uh, Davenport, uh, Pierce, and McDowell, uh, all those guys winning. Um, you know, that just never hurts. Even Ricky Weiss went in there at Eldora, you know, that's, uh, makes you feel good to stay on that stage uh, before you get the big money on the line. Um, I will, it's interesting to look back at the old hillbilly winners and what guys have, uh, won the hillbilly and then gone on to win, uh, um, the world 100. So Davenport did it in 2017. He's the last guy. The other, the only other two are Pearson, uh, way back in 20, 2006. Uh, and then even way back, uh, Donnie Moran in 1989. So uh, not always a lot of correlation there, but I did notice J.D. mentioned that in Victory Lane in Tyler County. So he he would definitely like that to be a yeah. thing uh, this weekend. Like Kevin, Todd, give me your World 100 notes, please. I was kind of looking at the the uh, interesting, uh, getting names that jumped off the the page to me of the expected uh, entrance uh that tyler nicely who's run that hatcher car he ran it uh the other night a couple of times uh, uh it's interesting to see how he will do that's good equipment uh, that's a car that's uh, run well at eldora uh tristan chamberlain of course just turned 16 i guess and just is uh, uh finally getting able to run eldora and be a little more uh, uh get a chance his chance for a chance at the world 100 uh, Matt Cosner, we've seen him run well lately. He didn't, uh, things didn't pan out the end at the North South for him so well, but he really ran well those first two nights there. Uh, and of course, he ran well at Port Royal uh, recently, uh, running uh, fourth and for his best Lucas Oil finish. And then another name that really kind of kind of surprised me when I saw it on there is uh, Jeff Cohn, the Sheridan, Michigan driver, who, uh, as far as I know, is pretty much been out of late model racing the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Uh, but he is on the list. Uh, notice he also won Saturday at Crystal Motor Speedway up there in Michigan. Uh, his first time he's won there, I think, since 2011. Uh, so it's been a while, and I don't remember him being a regular at Eldora before this. So so whether he sent his money in uh, just for a kick or if he's really <laughs> going to show up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having Kyle McFadden look into that. We're going to uh, see if we can write a little bit about Jeff, if, if it indeed uh, uh, he is making his uh, comeback. All right, Todd, who is your dark horse? We have been talking favorites, favorites, favorites. Who is a dark horse that can, we look up at the end of the day, see him up there running for the win, good top three run, but, you know, a dark horse I can bet money on this weekend. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm always afraid to say dark horse because somebody will say he's not a dark horse. <laughs> um, I guess one guy I like is Josh Rice. I mean, I, I I would like to see him run well. You know, he he was fast at the dream and got some scrapes and it didn't pan out that well. But but man, he has been. Uh, you know, I think for a long time I was like, oh, he's great at Florence. But man, you look at all the places he's winning. All the places he's winning and the cars he's beating. Uh, now, clearly, he's not running national tour events all the time and such. But, uh, 
but he's a guy that uh, I could see really, uh, uh, and I think he's a guy that the fans like because he just hangs it all out there. So uh, I would say he's he's the if he's not a dark horse, he's certainly a guy not on the favorites list always, uh, but who uh, could really turn some heads. Todd, you get a bonus question just because you've been doing this so long. You get one more question. Give me your favorite oh, no. uh, World 100 non-racing memory. Something that's not about, oh, Bloomquist and the little, you know, something like, just give me your favorite non-racing Eldora anecdote from the World <laughs> 100. Non-racing. So it can't be, their cars can't be on the track. when. Uh, that no, that could, or... that could count. That could count. Maybe you got into an argument with Larry Bowes or something like that, right? There's just some, some, some kind of Which something. Time? Yeah, right. Exactly. Which Larry argument, right? <laughs> Uh, what do you got? Um, I, actually, maybe that that is, and it's. I guess it's related to the racing, but there that that controversy about the Matt Miller thing at this at the scales, uh, you know, all those years ago from the dream, uh, being in the infield at Eldora and Sam Driggers and Larry Booz and Tony Stewart are trying to figure out kind of what happened. Like there's some, you know, did did the car weigh in? You know, and as it turned out, he weighed in light, and it was all legal. But there was. There was a little bit of controversy, and I remember at one point we're standing uh, in front of what is now the media center, but uh, back then was just that old building, and it's those three are standing there talking, and I'm just happened to be kind of looking for them, and I just walked up and start shooting pictures. So it's kind of us four standing together <laughs> there, and, and when Tony when Tony sees the flash or looks up and sees me take a picture, he grabs those two guys and they go atop that building to get away from everybody. Uh, they, he did not want uh, anybody else in on the conversation, but uh, uh, I'll never forget that. There are some interesting uh, post race infield moments, and that's. Uh, that's maybe the most memorable. Todd, I just know that you're going to pick Dale McDowell. I can feel it in my heart. I can feel it in my soul. Who is your winner? I think it's Dale McDowell. Who are you picking? Uh, I'm going with Davenport for all the reasons DJ said. Until I get a reason why he's not the best car uh, there, I, I'll uh, I'll stick with him. Now, my heart, uh, uh, my 56-year-old buddy, Dale McDowell, believe me, <laughs> if he crosses the finish line first, uh, I will uh, will not be will not be unhappy, but Davenport to me uh, is really going to be uh, tough to beat. All right, Todd, thanks so much, buddy. I really appreciate it. Couldn't do the media roundtable without you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take it easy. Thank you. That wraps up another edition, their 17th consecutive media roundtable. Bobby Pierce on the other side of the break and more on the 53rd World 100 coming up. We'll be back after this set of commercials. up to win with Buzzy Racing. With over 40 years of experience in motorsports and countless victories, Buzzy Racing provides teams with superior drivetrain sales and service. Whether you need assistance with transmissions, gears, axles, brakes, steering, drive shafts, or differentials, we have you covered. Family owned and operated, Buzzy Racing is dedicated to our customers on track success. What are you waiting for? Visit us at buzzyracing.com to learn more. Established in 1983, FK Rod Ends has been the industry leader for both midget and micro racing. Family owned and operated, we take pride in our products and our name because we know you value yours. Visit our website, www.fkrodends.com to find out how you can join our winning team. FK Rod Ends, to beat the best, you got to use the best. The fastest growing name in the motorsports industry is the racer's brand of safety gear and apparel. Winners wear K1. She always says it was Shane's happy place. This was his dream. He dreamed of, you know, racing and being part of the World's 100 and stuff. So it was all part of that. And it's like, how could we leave after, you know, getting the support we get here and from from other race venues, too? I mean, the support didn't come from just Eldora. We got cards from 
NASCAR drivers, and you know, it just came at his uh, viewing for his funeral. It was over like 2,000 people came, and there was race drivers from Canada drove all the way down to come to the viewing. And how can you leave that kind of support? Do you feel like you carry on his legacy by being here? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was pretty much born and raised here, but he he was part of this place. And, you know, it's it's kind of sad to say in a way, but his, his, lose, his losing his life here still made it as he is still part of this, you know, because people remember that. I've talked to people even this morning as I'm shuttling people back and forth to pits that remember his name, you know, and stuff. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of living on with him. And, you know, through Eldora doing the rookie door deal they do at the World's 100. A rookie in program. His, it's the Shane Unger yeah, Memorial yeah, Rookie Program. Yeah, it yeah. just keeps him, he's still involved. You know, Derek, we do some great things at Dirt on Dirt and Flow Racing um, content-wise. You know, the films, Dirty Dollars, Dirt with Kyle Larson, all that stuff. But the Road to Eldora series, and you saw it highlighted by the Shane Unger piece that we did there with his family. I apologize for the music there at the end. That's we, we take those clips from the actual Road to Eldora pieces, so that was some music from that piece there at the end. But um, I love the Road to Eldora series. It was awesome again this year. We'll, we'll recap it tomorrow when we arrive at the Speedway on Wednesday. Um, it was, a you know, the, the Unger family now, I think, has really become a fabric of the piece of, of Eldora Speedway. Yeah, so. it was a very emotional one as well. And uh, our guest won that night too when he uh, when Shane passed away that night. So yeah, our guest yeah. coming up won the, that. Oh, that's right. Order, that was so. that was seven years ago already. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Uh, one more note from Todd Turner here. One more graphic from him before we head into our guest. As we mentioned, let's take a look at this. Todd again, Derek. It was one of your notes was on here. Your Dale McDowell oh, note ticked off. Uh, the last time the World 100 had three first time top five finishers. 08. Clanton who won it. Matt Miller in fifth place, Tim McCready. How about this one? Joe Merrifield and Charlie Hughes won the World 100 in their only time, Derek, they ever started the event all the way back in the Start, win, and guys. retire. Start, win, call it quits at Eldora. Uh, on my mind, Georgia drivers, Davenport, Overton, and McDowell have, have led 512 of the last 1,000 feature laps. So over 50% of the last 1,000 feature laps, Eldora Derek have been led by guys from three states. It's going to uh, change one this. one state, excuse me. Our, our home state's going to change it this year. Um, so. I want to get you see the <laughs> RJ Conley note there about the most World 100 starts without a top five. He's got nine. Brandon Shepard and Brian Shirley have eight apiece. Uh, seven for Frank Hackenis Jr. I think a lot of people would be surprised to see him in there, but that's a nice note for Frankie. And Derek, this is the one you wanted to touch on. Dale McDowell has made all but one World 100 in the last 21 years and owns a current best race stretch of starting at 15 in a row. Dale McDowell has done just incredible. The guy deserves another World 100 title. Dale McDowell deserves another one. Well, he needs an actual World 100 title. Remember, he got given a championship. I think he would say the same thing. It's a little crass, yeah. the terms you're putting it in. I, I, he, he's, he's on the shirt. He's got the trophy. The one check, though, does not have his name on it. It's in Dyer's top rods. It's a shit of bad. Right. Right. But hey, all in all, he'll uh, take the win. And I think he really wants to cross the finish line first. I, though, 100%. So. He has a it could be. You know, his, it, listen, he's closer to the end of his career than he is the beginning. So, Dale, yes. it's, we got to get there. So, uh, just some more interesting stuff. And again, Todd Turner, thank you for all those notes. Very rightfully so. I think if you asked anybody who either casually follows dirt late model racing, or is a hardcore media person like us, who is the favorite to win the World 100 this year? There's likely three names on the list. Jonathan Davenport, who we've talked a lot about, uh, despite his struggles this year. He's won 13 races, Derek, including the Hillbilly 100. Uh, Ricky Thornton Jr., and obviously Bobby Pierce. I think it's those three guys, probably right now with the 20 RT and the 32, sort of elevating from the rest of the field. But one thing that I think makes it different for the last two guys I mentioned with Ricky and Bobby is that for the first time to me, coming into Eldora and coming into the World 100, um, we have two titans, two guys, and you're going to see these numbers later, who are having these monumental seasons. It's been a while since we've had two guys that much above everyone else in the sport. that um, They've just taken dirt late model racing by storm this year. One of those drivers joins us now to preview the 53rd World 100. It's Oakwood, Illinois' Bobby Pierce. 
Bobby, I'm going to start a little bit off the path from what we were just talking about with my first question. Ha- having said all that I just said about this amazing year you've got, and you're clearly one of the favorites coming into this event, you do already actually have a World 100 trophy. I don't think people have forgotten about it, but it's been seven years. I almost think it's been just enough time where people go, oh yeah, Bobby did win the World 100 when he was 19 years old seven years ago. Um do you feel that way a little bit too, that people kind of forget that, hey man, Davenport this, Ricky Thornton, Dav- we've already won one of these Globe trophies. I think people are forgetting that a little bit, Bobby. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, of course, a lot of people that are from around the area, that I, I don't think they'll ever forget, um, Illinois people in general. But uh, yeah, you know, it's it has been a while. Racing has changed a lot since then, yeah. you know, dirt late model racing, how the cars are. Just a lot of stuff has changed drastically. So we need to win another one. And, uh, you know, if we're going to win it, this could be the year we do because we're on such a hot streak. So see what happens. Do you feel comfortably, and I think the answer to this is yes, but I want to hear it from you. This is the best season of of your career, right? Uh, And if so, I kind of want to know why you think that. Not just the money and the wins, but I think it's the best season. Am I right or wrong about that? And, And why is it the best season in your opinion? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the best season we've had. I mean, uh, as far as like race winnings and just wins in general, I'm up to 27 now. And um, as every year, you know, you, you got a lot of woulda, coulda, shoulda moments, but um, we've had our fair share of those also. Or it could be more, but we've also had some really close finishes where we came out on top and uh, we've had some luck along the way. Heck, my last, uh, my last World of Outlaw win, I didn't have breaks at the end of the race and got that. <laughs> Sometimes you got to have a little luck on your side too, but you know, with this Longhorn, Bilstein shocks, everything, Vicky race engines, like we just, it, it's hitting. And we won some really big races this year too. You know, some races that I've wanted to win for a really long time, like the USA nationals and uh, won the North South 100 again. And uh, the year I won the North South in 2016 is when I won the world. So that's right. We'll see. You know, you mentioned the Longhorn. You, you know, you ran your family-owned built cars forever. Your dad, who is one of my favorite people on earth and is one of the smartest people in the pit area. I love Bob to death. It's no doubt he can build an amazing car. You, we saw your success. But candidly, you and I think some of your other family members said, for you to take the next step in your career, which you have now clearly taken, Bobby, you're one of the best two or three drivers in the country, it probably wouldn't be in a family-built race car. Why is that? What did they mean by that? And what is happening now in this Longhorn buddy that maybe couldn't have happened in the Pierce car? Can you explain that to someone like me who might not fully understand the nuance of of, of all that? Well, <laughs> remember when Suave said it was a shitbox earlier? <laughs> right. I did not say that, Bobby. I said I had people say that to me, and I said, no, <laughs> it's not a shitbox. Andy can wheel. So <laughs> don't put the finger towards me. I just got to use some crap. <laughs> no, uh, as we, we got really hot at the end of the year last year, and I think we applied some of that to this year. We just carried some of that momentum, but the Longhorn, uh, yeah, it's very good. It fit me very well from the very beginning. Um, just had a lot of balance, it felt like, and a lot of speed and everything you want as a driver. And it, it, like right out of the gate, their setup that they gave me when I left the shop, you know, it was pretty good. So, didn't have to adjust it far after that, and we were off winning races, and um, yeah, so I got to thank them guys for sure. You know, Steve Arpin, and Rumley, uh, Matt, all them guys, are, they're pretty smart. You just have, do you have a level of support there? I mean, listen, your dad is, nobody's going to support you more ever than your dad, but you mentioned, right, Kevin and Steve and those guys, with running a, a factory car, as I would call them, right, a, a mass chassis producer, you just get you get a level of support you can't get when it's just you and your dad. No matter how brilliant your dad's mind is, you just have more support, right? And that has to be part of this too, I'd think. Oh, it does. And, you know, one of the biggest things, like, you know, take my dad, for example, when he thinks of something like, oh, if the car needs this or that, um, which he's very smart, and this gives him some other brains to bounce the ideas off of. And, you know, they're always pretty open to ideas that we have how to go faster and uh my dad really likes that you know he can communicate with people that have the same mindset as him and they just want to go faster and it's really cool to see them do that and then you know even me if i have 
something that I want to try, like they're just always very open and, you know, there's more ways than one to skin a cat. So um, just whatever fits you. But yeah, it's very cool for him to have that knowledge to kind of bounce back off of and, and go from there. Derek, try not to make Bobby mad with your next question. I'm not. Okay. We're try not going to talk about the poop box. Don't worry. <laughs> but so my favorite spot to watch all the features every single night's on top of the press box. There were camera operators shoot. And I'm always paying attention to the lane of Lincoln drivers. You, Bab, Sheppy, you know, the Fager, all of them. But I noticed that this year's Dirt Late Model Dream, that you driving that car, you won a prelim, you got third in the, uh, the finale, that your car was just balanced and stable. And I feel like you could go anywhere on the racetrack. How confident are you going to this weekend knowing that, you know, hey, we, got, we were at the Dream. We felt damn good. I think it's possibly the best you felt in a car in a long time there. Oh, yeah, it, it was. And the track was super slick and there was no top. You couldn't go up, beat the wall down for 100 laps. and um eventually rubbered up pretty early in the race but before the rubber came the car was very balanced and and actually then when it rubbered up the car got unbalanced and i guess it was kind of laying over the right rear and everything but um so before that point i felt like i had a pretty good car and i was right there in contention to maybe win the race but yeah i mean uh we'll see if we have that again when you won the World 100 back in 16, Bobby, in, in the video after the race that we did, there's a pretty famous clip of your dad is with your sister, Sierra, and he's, he screams, I love you, Earl, at the sky, obviously talking about Earl Baltus, uh, the legendary creator of Eldora Speedway. I, I, just, Do you have any fond memories and stories that your dad tells you about Earl? I, I just feel like late at night, your dad's just sitting around the shop talking about Eldora and talking about Earl because not many people love that place more than your father. And I, I, I'd love to hear any of those or any of them that just jump off the, the map at you of, of things that your dad's told you over the years. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad's got some stories. No matter like what it is, that you could say something like, like with Earl, there's one story that he always talks about and that's how when um there was something that went on in the race that he didn't agree with and he was being a hothead about it and earl basically like pulled him up uh to the tower he was like come with me and they walked through the stands and they got to the top and they cracked open some beers and he was just like drink the beer and shut up and that <laughs> Yeah, it is a pretty cool story, but um, yeah, we haven't had a chance to talk about those old stories at all lately. We've been so busy, but it seems like it's go, 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 but whenever there's someone around in the shop that um, my dad gets to talking and telling stories, I hear that one like all the time. I love that story. He's told me that story, and I love it so much. I, I have a bit of a personal question I want to ask you, and I, I hope you're okay with it. I interviewed you back in January at the Wild West Shootout, uh, which will be here before you know it again. Um, it's not a total shock, this question, but I wanted to ask you in this setting leading up to Eldora. I said, other than Scott Bloomquist, Bobby, no one in my life, in my career in dirt late model racing has elicited more of a reaction from fans than you. And Scott got it good. Scott got it bad. I think you're more good. You're definitely, I mean, Scott got booed way more than you got booed. But I think you you elicit that Bloomquist level of reaction. Um, you're the only other person in my lifetime who's ever done it. And I think you should be happy and lean into that. That means you, you're doing something right. Have you ever considered in your career just saying, screw it, I'm going to go full bad guy. I'm going to do what Scott did. <laughs> just lean into it. Go full bad guy. Or is that not suit your personality? Which could be hard for me to do something like that too. I'm just curious if you've ever thought about that. I think at the end of the day, I'm a lot like you. I think Abby will say that also. I'm, I'm not a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there are times where, like, um, the aggression from how this sport is, it, it can take over and yeah. – um, you know, you see guys, they're different behind the wheel of a race car sometimes than what they are outside. But that's kind of different. That's not more so leading into the persona of something like that. But, um, you know, Scott, th there's only one Scott Bloomquist. And there will always only be one Scott Bloomquist, no matter what you, what you try to do. If someone tries to impersonate him, they're just not going to do it. But, um, you know, I, I love to see the mixed reaction in the crowd. I really do, because... It took me probably a long time to realize how important that is to have because you got to have that. Like, you know, you go to any major sporting event or anything like you're going to hear cheers and you're going to hear booze. And that's what makes it epic. 
So how excited are you that people won't be able to call you a cherry picker anymore just because you're going to win your <laughs> national championship or you're on pace to win it? You got a lot of these crown jewel wins. Like you're going out every single night no matter what series it, series it is. You're doing a lot more traveling, and you're, you're, you're backing it up. And I know those in the internet trolls on different websites are going to be very butthurt about it. I'm kind of <laughs> excited for you that you can you know show off uh, your driving ability throughout the entire country now. Yeah, no, it's definitely nice that it's all – paying off you know we've uh, worked very hard this season you know crew guys working hard my dad puts a lot of hours in the shop and um just everybody uh it's nice that to shut up the haters yes uh, <laughs> bobby a last couple things here i don't think it's a secret the track was not spectacular for the dirt late model dream eldora knows it trust me i know the people at eldora they've been talking about it they know it i'm of the opinion you mentioned the dream did not have a top. You could knock the wall down. Listen, I'm not saying it has to be as wet as it was Sunday night when Ricky Weiss won. I am of the opinion, though, for Eldora to be peak Eldora, we've got to have something around that lip at the top where Brandon Shepard and Bobby Pierce and and Brandon Overton, maybe not Overton now, but Overton six or seven years ago, could go up there and, and, and get a few tents up there as a little turbo boost if they need to. I think Eldora has to have it to reach its peak Eldora. Am I right about that? And I don't think anybody in the country is better to ask than you, the guy who would go up there and run that line. I agree. I, I think Eldora is such a, a nice wide racetrack. Um, I love to be able to use it all. So, um, you know, I'm not afraid to get up there and spark an arc on the wall and, and get that little speed boost you talked about. And I think the best racetrack Eldora ever is is when there's – like a little mud line around the bottom and a little cushion around the top. But, you know, we see on the prelim nights how uh, they're only 25 lappers. And uh, even if there's a little bit up there, like you're looking, you're like, man, there's not really any cushion. You can go make it work for 25 laps and you're going to see that and be like, oh, wow, the top can still be there. But it, in a 100 lap race, you need a lot more of it because you can't go up there and abuse your tires like that for 100 laps. You can't go risk knocking your spoiler off on lap 50 because um, you're going to need it on the last 20 when it's super ice slick. So um, sometimes I think we see that on the prelim nights and we judge and, and we kind of, you know, say, oh, well, the top's going to be there when really – Track prep probably is good all the time. <laughs> I think that's a fair statement. Final question. You or Ricky Thornton Jr., who's had the better year? I want to hear your answer. <laughs> uh, no, we both had great years, and uh, there's a lot of racing to go. So I'd say we can uh, probably come back around to that. And <laughs> how, many, how many wins is he at now? Uh, Ricky Thornton is 25, at I believe. 25. So we're, we're going to show a graphic here shortly. He's at 25 wins. You're at 27. You've raced head to head 38 times. You've won 21. He's got 17 of those. Um, first place money. He's got a little bit more than you, but, uh, it's tight, man. I, I think, uh, like it's too early, right? Let's see how the rest of the year shakes out. I we think. only have 900 races left this year. So. <laughs> hey, I'm just happy to be in the mix of, uh, talking about who might be the best this year. So, Yeah, buddy, I really appreciate it. I know, listen, I leave him on camera for a second, Kane. He got up early for us. He, he said, listen, I'm going to work at on the race car. His clock says 845. <laughs> he so he got, got up really early. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'm, because we texted with him last night, and he goes, guys, Swab Riggs, he goes, I don't think I can make it. He goes, I'm going to work on the race car all night. So I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for getting up and doing this show with us. We built the entire script around you, so I was going to be very sad if you couldn't do it. So please tell your girlfriend, Abby, thank you for getting you out of bed. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, really, I was. I think I got home at like six a.m. That's been a normal lately, though. Just working yeah. a lot, but you have to when you race. Like there's like 110 races on my schedule this year. So yeah, well, buddy, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It does mean a lot, and uh, good luck chasing that second glow, man. We appreciate it. You guys. All right, Let's thanks. <laughs> I, love, I love that. <laughs> a little tip at the end. All right, Swab, uh, Bobby, can he get it done this weekend? Does he get it done? No this doubt about it. Yeah. That guy's been fast, and like I said. The way I saw his car at the Dream, he definitely has a damn good shot at also those fat heads he made of us. I mean, we got we didn't even ask him about it. We're kind of we'll, salty about we'll it. We'll talk about that later. Yes. Uh, oh. We talked about that battle between uh, RTJ and Bobby. We're going to take a statistical look at that. We're going to take our final commercial break. When we get back, I've got a graphic to show you. You can draw your own conclusions. We'll be back after this, previewing the 53rd Annual World 100.
I'll just put it this way, we'll be back. With the hard work of Mark Richards and all the people at Rocket, we'll be back. Your opening night winner of East Bay Raceway Park is going to be Tyler Herb. The action winner gets it done on a Tuesday night at East Bay. But it's going to be the Reaper out of Marshalltown, Iowa. His first career win in the Lucas Oil Lake 100 Series. And it's going to be Hudson O'Neill getting his first win. Back-to-back -back winner at East Bay Raceway Park. Hudson O'Neill wins it. My grandfather started Winter's Performance in 1958, he had one goal, building the best, strongest speed parts possible for his fellow racers. Today, nearly 65 years later, our family still delivering on that goal, day after day, race after race. We're in this for the racers. We're in it for the competition. We're in it for the win. The White Silk Waves final pass. In the 32nd Annual World 100, Burke Hoffer has got to do it now if he's going to do it at all. He closes up Bloomquist at two, tries to dig to the bottom. Half a car length advantage for Bloomquist. Burke Hoffer is going to try to make it happen here. He'll slide beneath Bloomquist at four. He passes him. Bloomquist charges back at the strike. I think it was Burke Hoffer. I can't swear to it, but I think Burke Hoffer pulled off the upset. That's that's the number one moment still in, in Eldora history. I mean, it's a tough list of no green light, yada, yada, yada. That I mean, I just have the quote on my wall up here, right? I, that is still the number one Eldora moment of all time, in my that's opinion. That's tier one moment. Tier two, he'd be like, no green light, heat five. Uh, oh, I think, that, I think no green light's tier one. I mean, are there multiple of, of things in a tier? Yes. yes. Uh, so, maybe yes. Yeah, no green light's tier one. But if I'm ranking my tier one moments, Bloomquist, Fry, Bloomquist is in all of these moments. Yeah, so basically <laughs> anything with Bloomquist is <laughs> probably tier one. Right. Uh, Except news, for this one. Breaking, breaking moves, by the way, just do, coming do, do, out. Do, 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 uh, do, do, you see, do, you know, do, we do, mentioned do. we saw that Brandon Shepard's going to be driving with Kevin Rumley this weekend in that car that Kyle normally drives. Kyle was going to run the World 100, but I don't think the NASCAR folks are going to allow him during the chase coming off a win to do it. Um, Sheppy's going to be running with Rumley this weekend. News just comes out while we're on the air on Tuesday, Derek. He is the new quote unquote house car driver for Longhorn Chassis next year. It's kind of a big deal for him. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, T Mac, you know, was going to be hitting 50. Uh, Shepard has run a house car in the past, so I think he kind of knows how to interact with different drivers and, you know, uh, he just kind of knows like the business side of it for doing it so long with Mark Richards. And I think they wanted a younger guy too. And obviously Sheppy's only 30, which he's been racing for 28 years. <laughs> I don't know how it's possible, but so I think it's a good move for him. And I think it was kind of uh, all, all fingers are pointing towards him, but they made the announcement today that he will be the 20, yeah. 24 house it, car driver it, for Longhorn. Interesting house car. You think house car, you think rocket house car. It, it operates differently, I think. And I'm, I don't pretend to know the exact economics, but it's Mark Richards on the road in the hauler, owning the team. Owning. I, it's a little different, I think, with because you know Paler Motorsports with McCready, they had a big hand in the sponsorship. Right. And, yeah. And Riggs will. It's not exactly like the rocket house car, quote unquote, but um, good opportunity for Shepard, I think. Yeah. Uh, so well, that year. means Sheppy going back to Lucas. Yeah. Uh, I one one might think. I right? guess we have to read the press release. But I have a feeling that he's going to run Lucas next year. Yeah, the press release said that, or did not? I, say I haven't that. looked at the whole press release got yet. It, got it. So, uh, sp speaking of the the late model world, has been treated to. Speaking of, I should say, speaking of all this Ricky Thornton versus Bobby Pierce talk, right? The late model world has been treated to this incredible battle between, I think, of the two best young drivers in the country right now. And again, I say Sheppy. Sheppy's 30, so 30, under 30, right? I think Ricky's. Ricky's 33. Ricky, is he gone? Yeah. How old am I? You are 40. That's the basic. Oh math. my God! Like Ricky was, he was seventeen. I'm pretty sure he's thirty-three. When, when we started, he was sixteen. He's thirty. You're oh old. Oh my God! How did it happen? He okay. is. I'm, I think I looked this up. I think you're day. right. I 30, think he's in his three. early thirties. Uh, he's thirty-two. Will be thirty-three. He'll always be September. a child to me. Oh God! I don't know how this happened. Okay. He has kids. So you can't say young forever. Sheppy, Bobby, Ricky, the three best young drivers in the country this year. I think twenty RT and thirty-two have kind of separated themselves a little bit. We, we've been talking about this battle between these two the entire show. And I said, Todd, draw us up a tail of the tape. I want to put their numbers up on the board as we head into the biggest dirt late model race of the year. And let's take a look at it. So here you go. The tail of the tape, the statistical look at Bobby 
versus Ricky. Derek, I love we start with the actual tale of the tape, the height and weight, 5'10", 180, 5'8", 165. All this can makes me think of, listen, no matter what you think about Donald Trump. Yeah, Ricky Thornton's only 25 pounds lighter or 30 pounds lighter <laughs> than Donald Trump. No so. matter what you think about Donald Trump as a politician, I have plenty of thoughts on that. Uh, uh, what did he say? He was 6'3", 215, which is the same as Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Just absolutely preposterous that he listed that is his height and his weight. Anyway, let's move on. Tail of the tape between these two, Derek. First place purses, edge, edge there and just first place money to Ricky. Wins, edge there to Bobby, 27 to Ricky's 25. Top fives and top tens, very consistent there. 59 top fives, 57 for Bobby. $20,000 and up wins. Both of them, Derek, have eight on the year of $20,000 or more wins, 50,000 wins. Ricky's got one more. They both lead their respective national tours. First place in Lucas Oil for Ricky, first place in World of Outlaws for Bobby. And this is, remember a few years ago, I think it was Derek, it was it was Richards and- 2016. Yeah, Richards. Richards and Bloomquist. Bloomquist. And we, we went through, to decide the winner, we went through the head-to-head. We went through head-to-head, and that's why I brought this up. I'm the, glad you remembered that. These two have raced against each other 38 times. Bobby's nudged him 21 to 17. They'll probably race against each other at least 12 to 15 more times this year, I'd say. I'm, it's going to come right down to So me and Kovac talked about it last week. Leave Your this up, Kane. Leave this up, too. Thoughts about Ricky Thorne completely dominates Lucas Oil but doesn't win it, will that affect your voting because he's not the champion? No, because I think we can objectively look at the way the chase for the championship works or the way that Rick has set it up on Lucas Oil this year. It's a one-race championship, right? And I, I think it's cool. I think it's an opportunity for way more money injected at the points. I think Rick Schwally did the right thing there. I think it won't affect the way I look at Ricky Thornton because it's a one race championship. And I think objectively we can look at it right, that way. Okay. Right? So, so you're a smart voter then. Yeah, That's what I, I, I say. I'd like to think I'm a little more sophisticated voter. Derek, these numbers are interesting. And I think they're both, did I hear Kovac say they're both around three quarters I, of a I million? I said that. Yeah, they're both around 750 seven, yeah. for total winnings, bonuses, counting. Right. That's not even counting their championship money, what they get at the end of the season. So they're going to be both pushing a million dollars. So as we sit here on September 5th, 2023, that's what it looks like. The tail of the tape as we head into the World 100. I'm going to share that graphic on my social media here uh, as soon as we're done recording. Uh, get a little debate going. Who's number one? Let's figure it out. It's I think the head-to-head, man. I did the vote last week. 66% said RTJ over Pierce. Yeah, it's... I don't know. Like I have convinced myself both of them have been number one at one point 10 times in the last two months. So I, I don't even – let's see how the World 100 shakes out. How about that? Is that a cop-out? Yes. No, that's good. It's the Super Bowl. Uh, Suave, uh, and I, like I said, we'll put that out on our social media. As we head into the World 100, Derek, final thoughts for the Big E. All right, so I'm going to pull up my notes here. Yes, please. I think the fans are ready for a new winner. I know I J.D., Overton, their success stories there. Georgia has dominated. But I think – the way the crowd reacts to those guys, I think if we get a new winner in Instant Classic, that place is going to you know, go bananas, and it would like kind of re- refresh and restart the history of Eldora, like like the different sections, and maybe a new chapter, I guess I should say. I agree. They're going to be begging for a win there, and then they already kind of used my note earlier about Dale McDowell, which is kind of BS. <laughs> 15 straight is pretty damn impressive for the Mac Daddy, and we had a podcast about like just – can drivers keep up with what Dale McDowell has done at 57? And really, Billy Moyer was the only guy like, in, yeah. you know, when he was 57, he was still winning, you know, the Knoxville Nationals and stuff like prelims. So McDowell, I, I, I think he could still race until he's like maybe 62, 63 the way he goes, but be pretty cool to see a win. But yeah, 15 in a row for him is pretty impressive. Thank you, Todd, for ruining my stats. Yeah, 20, and he's, in the last 21 years, he's only missed one World 100, which is nuts, too. I've got some uh, some good World 100 notes here. I mentioned Jason Jamison's going to be in that other Ratliff car. Cody Evans, Derek, will be in that Benji Hicks double nickel car as well this weekend. Kind of an interesting note. Todd brought up some guys I didn't even know were on the entry list uh, that had entered the race, which is which is cool as well. You always get that with the World 100, right? Every late model driver wants to get one World 100 under their belt, right? So you get some guys that go, uh, you know, we keep talking about this Dirt Track World Championship, and people don't forget in about 40-plus days, there is another big event at Eldora. The last big race of the year at Eldora is always the World 100, not this year. Dirt Track World Championship, mid-October at Eldora, two-day event. Four drivers on the Lucas Oil Chase will be dumped into that race as we head into that race. If you're not in the top four, you can't win the championship. Whoever finished the highest out of that top four, Derek, will win the Lucas Oil Championship and might be racing for three hundred thousand dollars that night, two hundred grand to win the title, and a hundred thousand dollars to win the race. JD could be your Lucas Oil Champion when the year's over. Uh, that's what a lot of people have been talking about. Like, 
JD is really good there. I think that his one goal was just get into the top four, and he was outside looking yep. in for most of the season until the last couple of weeks. He finally got by T Mac and Brandon Overton, Overton and T Mac and Devin Moran battling for yeah. that final spot. We'll be talking more Eldora in a month, right? We will be talking about is it too much Eldora? Maybe, maybe we'll find out. I think that last race is going to be incredible. If those four guys, can you imagine if they're one, two, three, four with twenty laps left at the Dirt Track World Championship? Are we going to stage it like NASCAR? Yeah, we the are. Final four. No, the sure. final four is like battling out like. Everybody else kind of just like glides <laughs> back right through. Uh, I heard you heard JD talk about that right at the SRX race. They're like, "All right, now forty nine, don't or whatever his number was. Don't don't get too far ahead here." They were saying that in his radio. So a uh, big car count jump last year went from eighty during the double world one hundreds of twenty one. Derek to hundred and seven last year. Nearly a hundred cars. I think we'll be in that eighty five to ninety five range last year. Can you imagine? We had 242 one year. Can you fathom? We couldn't do this format. Oh, well, the format would be impossible, but it, I can't even, I don't even want that anymore. I don't even want 200 cars at these races anymore. Am I wrong for saying that? No, you're uh, completely right because there'd be a lot of guys in the non-qualifier races. And we don't need, <laughs> we don't need those at thir- three or four It'd in the morning. Like we had the, in the morning. We had the oldest. All right, Rigsby, you have any more? Yes, I do. One, okay, well, uh, one last thing. I have I, a good I, trivia We question talked about it you. with Jonathan. I think a lot of people thought these six globes was unbreakable. Jonathan can tie it this weekend. Jonathan Davenport, Jonathan Davenport, JD, my guy, my buddy, could win his sixth World 100 trophy this weekend, tying Billy Moyer. The unthinkable. He could tie Billy Moyer, Suave. And if he wins it, I think he surpasses Moyer in Eldora lore in general. Agreed. Totally agree. He's got a million. He's got six worlds. He's got same amount of dreams. Two dreams. He's got that uh, COVID year race. You know, whatever that. Which one? Intercontinental. Thank you. That one. <laughs> um, last quick note. Track was pretty wet for Ricky Weiss's Sunday night victory at the Baltus Classic. Very very wet. Um, is that a foreshadowing for this weekend? After the dream was too dry, they go very wet. Is it foreshadowing for this weekend, Suave? Uh, let's just go happy medium, like right in the middle. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, All right, I will give you $10,000. Yeah. If you look at me, make sure you're not on your computer, you can name the top six finishing order of the 2013 World 100. Oh, my God. I mean, it's a lot of money I'm, like, risking here. There's no chance. There is no chance I'm getting this, so just just read it out. There's no way I can well, do it. We can guess the winner. 2013. Um, did Clanton win 2013? He no. won 2012, I think. Uh, Blankenship? He was the winner. So Blankenship won 2013. Um, so I've got one. Man, I'm five guys away from 10,000. Bloomquist second. Ooh, he got third. Ah. Daryl Lane again second. Bloomquist third. A young, very young Bobby Pierce fourth. Josh Richards fifth. And Terry Phillips six. Oh wow, <laughs> TP was six. That, I just added six there because I, the top five you could like magically. And get TP right. rarely runs Eldora ever. Yeah. So, so wow. Bobby Pierce was what nineteen? He was sixteen. Wow. His first How year about there, that? I think. I did get the winner, Blankenship. Bloomer, Bloomer, you just know is in the top five at that yep. era. That was a good job period. though. Whew. Okay. Uh, don't forget that again this weekend, Kane. We'll wrap it here. You can watch the World One Hundred live every single lap Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of the biggest granddaddy of them all can be seen live on Flow Racing. Of course, our sister website, Dirt on Dirt, will have a ton of content. So will Flow Racing, just oodles and oodles of content. Suave will be doing his thing. Kovac, our entire team, watch the world live this weekend. And and Kane, don't forget, and Derek, don't forget, one week from today, the return of Castrol Flow Racing Night in America. We're back from America's Dirt Track, Fairbury Speedway. We'll be doing not a studio show that night. Derek will be live from the racetrack. You I heard be, next year, me or you and are going live the whole time at um, every racetrack. Oh, uh, yeah. No, that's not true. Dang it. Um, okay. We are doing Castro Flow Racing Night in America live from Fairbury next Let's week, go. Tuesday the 12th. We are back. We expect a great uh, field between Eldora and Knoxville. Uh, very excited about that. Our sprint car friends. High limit, Derek. I don't know if you heard, Dale Earnhardt Jr. attending this race at Lernerville Speedway on September 26th. High limit is back September 26th. Dale Earnhardt Jr. coming and doing the podcast, hanging out for Brad and Kyle. It's going to be a big night in Sarver, Pennsylvania, Suave. And the guy that runs the series is going to be signing less autographs than Dale Earnhardt Jr. That would be the only time probably anywhere he goes that he doesn't sign the most. Uh, I feel very confident in saying you are correct about yes. that. Dale Earnhardt Jr. will sign more autographs. Unless we go to Fairbury, then McKay Winger gets more than him. That is true. Don't, for, don't sleep on McKay. And lastly, uh, next weekend, not this coming weekend, but next weekend. New the, sponsor for the race. The, yeah, the Knox Center Drink, Knoxville Late Model Nationals. Is that right? They sponsor the Late Model Race now, too? This is the first one. It's always been Lucas Oil. That's right. Okay. 
Look at this. So Casey's. Basically, basically the Sprint Car sponsorship on this too. We'll sponsor the Late Model Nationals as well. One of the, Derek, that is my sneaky, favorite. Sneaky one of the best weekends of the year is that Knoxville it's Late Model. It's my top National five race. race weekends of the year. I love it. The, the event, the people, the weather, everything about Knoxville. The Sprint Car people absolutely hate us being there. They want nothing to do with us It's at like all. My, It's like my uh, show me, like for you growing up, like yep. where it's just like. Sleepy. Yep. Not as many people because you're just coming off the World 100. Yep, and yep. I don't know. The racing is always awesome. And the quick nights, I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. No, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. All of those events live on Flow Racing. We are back. I am back after a little time off from Flow. I'll be at the World 100 this weekend. Derek, uh, for Derek Kessinger, of course, a World 100 lover like myself. For Kane Runyon, who's flying to Port Royal for the Tuscarora 50 today. We got to get Kane oh, out Oh, there's another here. race yeah. this weekend other than the World. Yeah, the Tuscarora 50 live on Flow Racing as well this Let's weekend. Go. Thank you guys so much. Please. Please enjoy all of our World 100 coverage. We will see you from the Biggie this weekend. 53rd World 100 coming up.